Shang Sham Pema Gesar Dang Vola Yashen Choki Nub Drune Pema Jun Eje Sutra Kordu Kandro Mang Pokor Keki Jesu Dak Duki Jinji Lop Sher Shak Suso Guru Pema Siddhi Ho Ogen Ugi Nub Shang Sham Pema Gesar Dang Pola Yashen Choki Nub Drune Pemajune Jesu Drag Kordu Kandro Mang Pokor Keki Jesu Drag Duki Jinji Lob Sher Shek Suso Guru Pema Siddhi Ho Ung Ogen Ugi Nub Shang Sham Pema Gesar Dang Pola Yashen Choki Nub Drune Pema Jhune Jesu Drag Kordu Kandro Mang Pokor Keki Jesu Drak Duki Shinji Lob Sher Shek Suso Guru Pema Siddhi Ho Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. <clears throat> teacher, Foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you chief of humans were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust. Massless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, feel devotion like merits and good qualities. To the thus gone, I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, while abiding in the pure trainings, Holy field endowed with good qualities. To the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha. Homage to the Dharma Refuge. Homage to the Great Sangha. To all three, ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, 
bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and in all aspects. With supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all seen and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness and death. I take refuge in the guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, May I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning of this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen. May I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. For my masters, my items, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam Guru Ratna Mandalakam Tiyami. In the heart of the perfection of wisdom sutra. <clears throat> I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on Bass of Mulcher's Mountain on Rajagriya together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan is absorbed in the concentration on the categories of the phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom, should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. 
there is no I element and so on and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance and so on and up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, tayata, gate, gate, para, gate, para, sam, gate, bodhisoha, tayata, gate. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection like that, the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose in that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shari Putra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Ashuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Do you have a copy of the, or you're not doing the request? Oh, I thought that was at the very end. <laughs> no, because then it's over. No, it's oh, now. Okay. Yeah. According to the wishes of sentient beings and their capacities for the high and low, common and uncommon vehicles, please turn the wheel of Dharma. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Dirk suggested it would be nice to have the short request for teachings. Uh, that's a good idea. Um, and uh, like a scholar presented various different um, versions. They're all pretty much the same. The one um, uh, we just used today uh, uh, from Kimposewa uh, Dongyal from Padmasambhava Buddhist Center um, back east. Um, and uh, I had the honor of uh, meeting him uh, a number of years ago. So it's always nice when uh, you know the teachers. It's the best when you do. Um, the um, Padmasambha Buddhist Center does uh, very wonderful uh, teachings. Um, so if, uh, you know, they're doing some online retreats now, I think. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in finding out more, then ask me first. Uh, uh, Dirk does things properly. So he said, oh, 
Lamala uh, would can I have permission to do the retreat? I think it's a retreat right now, Dirk. Is that right? So uh, the retreat ended yesterday. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, so um, the uh, this is uh, the center there, uh, Padmasambhava Buddha Center, and the teachings are uh, very competent, very high level teachings. Uh, so I like to recommend, you know, if uh, you know people want to explore, uh, you know, the particularly the background and uh, Zogchen style teachings, and uh, that would be great, like that. So. Um, uh, it's traditional to ask one's the teacher uh, permission to attend something, even though um, <laughs> you, you know the teacher might say yes. Um, but uh, every once in a while I say no, and then uh, uh, I like to joke, I'm everyone's llama until I say no. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, one of the benefits of doing uh, Dharma practice now um, in some form for 50 years. Uh, I've had the good um, karma to meet some really competent teachers. And over a period of time teaching in America, we can see if the teachings and the teachers still hold up, you know? So, uh, you know, Dirk, I hope, I hope you had a good retreat and thank you for doing the retreat. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, he's a fantastic, he, he's fantastic. Yeah. Yes. And he's always he's always uh, so he's so uh, he's so obviously compassionate and, and and I know you already know all of this that I'm teaching you and then he goes off and teaches you the highest levels of Sochan. So. That's right. Uh, so uh, we're blessed to have online teachings now, and I'm glad people can be here online. But uh, you know, being uh, in a, a teacher's space. Um, and actually feeling the energy come off them is really uh, beneficial. So um, I hope we all get a chance uh, to meet in person and get to meet in person the teachers you want to meet. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> it was also a nice prayer from um, Chadgud Gompa, um, translated by uh, Chokinima Richard Barron, um, who's also a wonderful teacher. So. Maybe we could switch off, you know, sometimes it's nice, but they all say the same thing. <clears throat> so um, today we're continuing to talk about the 12 links, um, 12 Nidanas, 12 links of dependent origination. And um, these are meant to be meditating and contemplating on so that we develop the um, strong determination to uh, you know, free ourselves uh, and others from uh, the cycle of birth and death from samsara, from the craziness. So <clears throat> that's what we're uh, going to be talking on um, for a while. <clears throat> the, uh, the whole point of the teaching is not intellectual, really, um, so that we just understand how uh, things are screwed up. Uh, the point is to uh, develop this uh, real felt sense that we uh, have to uh, uh, become free and stop harming ourselves and others. <clears throat> so what I want to talk about tonight is how, uh, how that's a felt sense and how uh, we develop that. And I'd like to hear um, from people if they're willing to share how they've um, developed the ability to really um, emerge uh, definitively from from suffering. In Tibetan, it's called uh, Nejung, uh, definite emergence. <clears throat> when uh, I was uh, living at Sarajay Monastery in South India, um, uh, after teachings or after my retreat, then uh, we'd sit around uh, or I'd sit around with the teachers and um, uh, they'd still be teaching, even though we're kind of off, because uh, you're never really off at a monastery. But uh, uh, they would say, oh, have you developed uh, Neijung? And I'd say, yeah, I, I've, 
uh, try to develop some renunciation of samsara, and they go, no, that's not a good, that's not a good translation. Uh, they go, it means definite emergence. And then they'd say, okay, you say it in Tibetan, and I'd go, Nejong. And then they would go, no, that's, that, you didn't say it right. <laughs> and then I'd say, and then they would say it right, or however they say it. Then they would say, now what is it? So actually that went on uh, for about three weeks. <laughs> Just going into depth all the uh, different uh, aspects that we wanted to emerge from. So classically, samsara is um, this addictive, cyclic, um, screwed upness uh, that uh, manifests also in the six realms. It's called uh, the six realms, generally are depicted also in a tanka that traditional temples have. Uh, you might see uh, at the very entrance. So we do have a wheel of life um, tanka, and it's uh, divided like a pie in the six uh, realms. And at the top is the uh, sometimes called the god realm, uh, deva realm, and the gods uh, are uh, generally so blissed out that they're not doing any dharma practice. And uh, when their karma runs out, they um, will suffer a lot because then they'll fall. And the second realm <clears throat> generally is uh, the uh, you know fighting god realm, the asuras. And they have the pleasures of the gods, but they're always uh, fighting over the tree of life, and they're very jealous. Um, uh, they they want to get to the center, and they're willing to kill for it. Um, uh, you know, similar folks might be the ones you know uh, climbing over the walls of the capital a couple of weeks ago. You know, they they believe that the way to establish peace is through violence, right? Um, the God realm is the way to establish peace, of course, is through um, getting all your needs met, to all your pleasures. Then the next uh, realm is the um, hungry ghost realm, Pratas. And um, uh, the Pratas uh, are depicted um, with very big stomachs and that narrow uh, necks and um, mouths with very sharp teeth. And um, they have a very difficult life because they have desires too, um, but they misperceive how things are. And um, for example, they uh, are very thirsty. And then but when they get to water, the water turns into molten lead. Or they're very hungry, but because their neck is so thin, they can't take much in. So um, they have... Uh, they imagine that peace will come when they satisfy their desires, but their desires are never satisfied. Then the, the lower realm, uh, the lowest realm, that's uh, called the uh, uh, Naraka, has uh, uh, 18 um, hot and cold, sometimes translated as hells. Um, and uh, these are uh, different styles of aggression and anger. Um, so there's cold anger and there's hot anger. So uh, in, in these realms, uh, beings are very frustrated because they can't find any peace at all. It's, things are constantly happening to them. They're constantly harming themselves and harming others. So a complete uh, opposite of peace. <clears throat> and um, as we move up a little bit, then there's the animal realm, it's called, um, and animals are animals. So uh, the difficulty in the animal realm is that the animals are uh, always having to uh, really work hard um, and look for food all the time and be watchful that they're going to be attacked and eaten like that. So, uh, you know, the uh, difficulty in the animal realm too is that they're uh, not able to figure out uh, how this is happening. You know why why they have to work so hard. Or not. Do, do any of you feel like you're sometimes in the animal realm? <laughs> you know, it's like uh, you're you're constantly having to work, constantly having to watch out for things like that. 
So there's suffering there. And finally, there's the human realm, and the human realm is based on desire. The human realm is based on uh, actual pleasure and wanting to get things. Um, but the problem is it's characterized by uh, suffering in the sense that we um, don't always get what we want. Uh, and then when we get what we want, it doesn't last. Uh, and then many times we don't get what we want. We, uh, I mean, we get what we don't want, and then that seems to stick around. So <laughs> does that feel familiar? But in the human realm, um, we have the capacity uh, to uh, question and to wonder why this is so. So the human realm is also characterized by um, uh, inquiry and questioning and curiosity. So uh, we're, we're constantly comparing things. So there's a, a real lot of intelligence there if we use it. Like, is this really a good idea? Am I really, am I really getting what I want? Uh, why do I just end up with getting things I don't want? So the human realm has that curiosity, but uh, it's still a realm. Uh, so uh, it's still characterized by samsara. So actually, um, in traditional Buddhism, uh, you don't want to be um, caught in any of the realms. So uh, you don't want to be um, a god or uh, a jealous god, fighting god. You don't want to be a hungry ghost. You don't want to be uh, an angry hell being. You don't want to be uh, an animal. And actually, you don't want to be a human being. You want to be a Buddha. In any of the realms, uh, we can wake up, actually, uh, if we get the right teaching. So even though the human realm is the best, um, in a sense, the most curious, um, uh, we can, uh, with enough effort, we can we can wake up in, in any of the realms. So sometimes Lama say, well, you got to be born into the human realm uh, to figure things out, but uh, uh, that's not always necessary. So uh, it's just uh, supposedly easier because <clears throat> the Buddhas uh, can journey to any realm and. Um, any of the realms can give teachings. So uh, many of us think that in a large way, a lot of animals make uh, make a lot more sense and make a lot uh, better decisions than uh, human being kind of animals. So they want to be reborn in the animal realm. So if that works for you, if you think, okay, I want to be a really intelligent crow or intelligent cat and I would do Dharma practice best there, then you might want to be born there. But um, actually, we want to transcend all the realms uh, together. <clears throat> so that's the, the realms are how samsara is characterized. And it just goes on and on so that um, we, in the next life, we have to experience the same sufferings all over again, the same kind of realm all over again uh, forever. Traditional Buddhism uh, postulates and uh, believes and shows evidence for uh, unlimited past lives and unlimited future lives. So there's a continuity of mind and a continuity of karma. Uh, there's a famous uh, kind of debate from uh, the 80s maybe between Stephen Batchelor, a um, kind of agnostic Buddhist and um, Robert Thurman uh, was, was very emphatic kind of Buddhist. Uh, Robert Thurman arguing that uh, in order to practice Dharma effectively, particularly Tantra, you have to believe in the continuity of mind. And Stephen Batcher is saying like, no. So um, you might want to examine like, uh, and we can talk about that you know, in discussion, like in order to develop renunciation, is it absolutely necessary to say, I really don't want to be doing this stuff all over again. Um, how many people would want to completely do their same life over and over again forever? Uh, that, that might be kind of difficult, but maybe you think you would. But uh, we should talk about whether we think uh, mind comes to an end uh, when the physical body dies, or mind, deep mind or consciousness and karma tend to uh, go forward. Traditional ideas. Samsara is unbearable, not just because it happens uh, once 
or we just have one lifetime, but because uh, when we contemplate that um, we'll have to uh, go through the same stuff all over again um, with the same idiots, then uh, it's unbearable. So based on that, um, the suffering of this life and the idea that not only uh, could it get worse and that it'll never end, um, then that is uh, one of the deepest causes for renunciation or uh, definite emergence, they <clears throat> In a way, it's, a, you know, wanting to become free and happy uh, uh, because we don't want to continue to suffer anymore is kind of the flip side of uh, the suicidal impulse. Like um, when people are contemplating suicide or leave suicide notes or attempted suicide, uh, I have talked to many of these people over the years and uh, I'm sure we've all had uh, those thoughts ourselves if we admit to it. Uh, one of the key parts is like, I, I don't see this ever stopping. I don't see the pain ever stopping. I just want to end it. So we believe that the way um, to end it, um, you know, is to shoot the body. Uh, during one question and answer period with uh, Trung Paramshay at Naropa in the um, 70s, somebody says, well, um, you know, it all ends because I've just shot myself. And uh, Trung Paramshay said, well, that'd be very nice if you could shoot the mind too, but you can't. So uh, he was pointing out that uh, uh, the mind moments uh, are continuous uh, and uh, are fresh and uh, they emerge, uh, uh, you know, eternally. So for those people that are reading um, Uttara Tantra Shastra, um, you'll see what I'm talking about. So the idea that we could never be free if we continue doing the same thing and that we'll have to go through it and watch the people we love go through it again uh, is unbearable. So uh, that is the classic way that, um, you know, from individual liberation point of view, we uh, develop definite renunciation. What's interesting uh, on a personal nature is what, uh, how, you know, we could contemplate that but that there's always some kind of um, turning point or some kind of uh, bottom that uh, we say uh, sometimes in recovery is the zero point where the shit has to stop. And for some people, it's very dramatic. They go through uh, an illness, they go through a divorce, they go through imprisonment, and they go, I I'm never going back to that again. Um, but for other people, they go through all kinds of crazy stuff and it doesn't seem to make any difference. And other people, though, know, sometimes uh, make radical changes, but it's not um, it's not dramatic. So um, when I used to work uh, almost exclusively with heroin users, I'd always say, well, for the people that actually stopped using and got into recovery, I said, why'd you stop? And um, they generally didn't tell a long war story about how you know they were in jail and their health was failing. They just said, well, it was weird. One day I just didn't feel like doing it anymore. Now there had to be some causes and conditions to bring up to that, but um, it's very interesting, the dramatic changes where people emerge from one set of behaviors to another, sometimes is, is kind of mysterious. It's like for one moment their fruit is on the tree and then next moment it's dropped. So how that process happens has always been really interesting to Buddhists and to other religious people too, and psychological uh, people too. Like when is someone ready to make a change, you know, like that? Um, and what uh, would be the possible causes? But sometimes they seem to be mysterious. You know, why do suddenly people go enough is enough? <clears throat> the recent uh, political events and attempted coup d'etat um, you know, led me to really want to say, you know, I, I really don't want to be around violent, angry people. I don't want to be around people that are uh, saying the, the way is violence. So uh, it's, it's really um, not fun when you've been around people that are violent or you've been uh, abused or violated yourself. So uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, renew my definite emergence. Like, Dharma is really about peace, not about uh, giving in or being a wuss, but uh, really saying we, we don't think uh, violence is the way. <clears throat> so uh, I'm trying to do a more uh, definite emergence into that. So uh, if Buddha Dharma uh, historically is anything, if the essence of Buddha Dharma can be put together, of course, uh, as an inner yogis, we would say we want to understand nature mind, we want to stu study nature, uh, understand nature phenomena uh, and nature self, right? Um, but uh, what's all that look like? It looks like someone who is at peace and not advocating violence. It looks like so for someone who's creative and, and who someone wants to benefit others. Yeah, uh, so uh, that's why we say one of the marks of knowing that you're Buddhist is uh, nirvana is peace. So sometimes I ask people, like, what are the four um, essential marks of uh, uh, being uh, a Dharma person? And uh, we, sh we should know that. It, it doesn't say anything religiously at all. It just says, uh, you know, uh, all composite phenomena are impermanent. Everything that has parts is going to fall apart. And all uh, tainted are conflicted phenomena are going to be suffering. And third is all uh, phenomena are selfless and empty. Uh, they're interdependent. Uh, and the fourth one, does anybody in the audience know what the fourth uh, mark is? The fourth seal, sometimes it's called. Nirvana yeah. is peace. Nirvana is peace, exactly. Yeah like that. So um, generally, uh, I think we, we overlook how, how difficult it is to achieve peace and how uh, much work we have to do and dialogue and stand fast and um, not be discouraged. But yes, Nirvana is peace. Hmm. So um, I'd like to uh, open uh, up for discussion here. Um, but uh, before that, just say a few things technically about the 12 links. The two links that are generally um, seen as the most important are is desire and ignorance. <clears throat> and by the way, the, the term for the links is kind of interesting. The links uh, are kind of like cheap jewelry, like the thin and when you buy <laughs> maybe a cheap uh, uh, chain, you know, the, they're not closed up. Can people see my hand a little bit? You know, there's a little thing, you know, a little gap there. So uh, I was talking to Morris earlier and Morris said, well, how, how, how do we, you know, it looks like it's so solid, but that's the thing is if you look closely with your jewelers um, in a magnifying glass, you see, oh, there's, there's that link there, you know, and it's not actually closed. It looks like it's very solid, but um, the link is generally uh, broken uh, first through, uh, you know, um, not giving into every impulse or every desire. Uh, of course, ignorance is the main cause, but actually we have to start, uh, you know, a little before ignorance. So generally, if someone's trying to overcome uh, any kind of addictive behavior, the odd part is we have to stop the behavior before we find out why we're really doing it. That's not until we uh, stop something that we see what the driver was. <clears throat> so a common misperception uh, among meditators and yogis, not just in America, but everywhere, is like, I'll just become enlightened or whatever that means or more aware and then my you know negative behaviors my unpeaceful harmful behaviors um uh will will stop automatically they'll just kind of roll to stop i won't have to deal with them and they'll just kind of go away um unfortunately it doesn't work that way you first have to look at them and then inhibit them somewhat in a positive way and then you'll find out what's driving it 
and then you'll see how the mind is creating this uh, conflict and this ignorance. <clears throat> Uh, I wish I wish we could just kind of wake up and stop things. And of course, the more we turn on the light inside, uh, the easier it is. But uh, generally, we have to stop first. And that's why we have to do uh, some stopping practice, like we actually have to sit on a cushion and uh, uh, stop the internal chatter for at least a few moments. Okay, so... Uh, there's a good turnout today from all over, and I'm glad you're here. But hopefully, we can have a good discussion before you have to go home. Robert, yes. There's a place to go with that uh, debate between uh, Dr. and uh, Oh. That's very scholarly. Thank you. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Lama, I was wondering, you know, the the term nidanas, and then there's yeah. the nidana, right, which is the uh, like the avam. Thus, have I heard, is the nidana. I, I, I this just happened to me yesterday. <laughs> I started thinking about this because sometimes the nidanas are translated as cause, also instead of link, and. Uh, I wonder if there is a relationship between the nidana, the cause of the beginning of the of the teaching, and and, and the twelve. The, just the, I'm just talking about the word, and I'm sorry if that's a little bit too off base, off, you know, subject. But when you talk, we're talking about the links. It just activated that. And my main thing with is not wanting to have to do. I don't want to have to start over. <laughs> I really don't want to yeah. have to start over. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, usually we have favorite things that we we don't want to do over again. Uh, lots of times uh, it does have to do with uh, some childhood or some grade in high school. But uh, you know, all joking aside, yeah, we don't want, you know, if honest, we don't want to go through the horrible traumas that we've all gone through. I, do, I don't, this is cause for further study, you know, around Nidana. Um, so uh, another way that it's presented, or I guess I've presented or heard it presented is kind of like dominoes, right? So uh, if we line them up very closely and just one stop, then they all are gonna go down. And um, one of the purposes of meditation or insight is, is to uh, uh, lengthen the space, right? So when one goes down, the whole thing doesn't go down like that. But uh, I like these scholarly things, so maybe some of us will uh, investigate further. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hi. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Susan. Yeah, go. Um, you know, you were talking about definite emergence uh, and and the other word being renunciation, and so what I'm wondering is in order to give it up isn't it helpful to replace it with something and if if you're if you're want to emerge from the suffering of samsara wouldn't you want to replace that with bliss replace that with bodhicitta i mean so it's like a two-prong approach yes that's a good point. So uh, hopefully uh, we're not only seeing the one thing, uh, this addictive cycle is really unsatisfactory, real dukkha, it's really fucked up. And then we have the possibility, we have the hope or at least the possibility or the, the certainty that there's something better. So generally those two um, come together uh, and, and that's when there's some kind of spark. Uh, you know, when you read the stories of the 84 Mahasiddhas or people's biographies, there's generally some point which was kind of a turning point where uh, they met someone or something happened that, so the hope for something better or the certainty for something better was put right next to the unsatisfactoriness of like aggression or stupidity or something. And so, you know, there was a turning, a turning point there. 
it doesn't always mean that people meet uh usually it's depicted people meeting human teachers uh or human beings but uh teachings or uh, meetings can be um you know visionary or uh animals or nature talk to people too uh so uh and it can be just uh you know, seeing, uh, hearing a teaching of cause and effect like that. So yeah, there's, there has, there's something, there's some auspicious coincidence, you know, some, uh, Tashi that happens like that. Yeah, because, I think people need to see both. Because personally, that's, that's what I'm experiencing, I think is, but it isn't like, a, a, a you know, a one, event thing like Shariputra heard that it isn't like that for me yeah it's a gradual um building up of of um experiences a gradual building up of of feeling uh yeah generally actually i trust that more um uh ones that are you know we can see the gradual nature so that uh, it's like describing the teachings of uh, seeing somebody way down the road approaching to us. So we know it's somebody, but it may even be an animal or something. But then gradually, as they get closer, we, we see who they are. And then it comes into full focus like that. But there are instances of, uh, you know, very profound, profound kind of, uh, use a little bit of Christian term, like uh, conversion experiences where... Um, you know, people uh, turn things around very quickly, but uh, they would still have to have some causes and conditions behind it, right? Mm -hmm. Hi, James, in TV land. Good morning, Lamala. Good to see you. Good to see everybody. Uh, my question dovetails into Susan's question. When you think about, um, antidotes to things and applying the antidote and then moving beyond the antidote and then thinking about um, the bliss state that can arise in meditation um, and then what is the problem with the bliss state arising you know getting attached to it as well can you talk a little bit about that movement from going from you know, this, this difficult experience to applying the antidote and having some success with it and then moving beyond the antidote and what, what that all looks like. Um, for some people that kind of works, you know, um, like there's a, uh, famous, uh, drug harm reduction program where, um, if people like have one day of sobriety, then, you know, they they get a point, or they, you know, or they get to pull something out of the jar, like their, you know, the Starbucks coffee or something like that. So you, you get that kind of, uh, you know, little reward kind of thing. Like bliss is a little bit of reward as an antidote. Um, there's a lot of debate, of course. Uh, you know, when when the antidotes stop working or they run out, is someone going to, you know, maintain their recovery like that? So, you know, if we say, okay, I'm really tired of uh, being angry all the time, so I'm gonna meditate on loving kindness or something, or just patience or equanimity. And uh, so the first week or two while you're doing that, it's like, great. But then um, that fades and it's harder to reproduce that kind of feeling and then, uh, so do we go give it up or what do we do? What do you think? <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've definitely had that experience and struggled with that experience, um, which is part of the reason I brought it up. And I've, I found that it's, it's in the falling back to the behavior and realizing that there's something beyond the antidote. There's something bigger than all of that that helps me move forward. Um, and it's a felt experience. It's, it's, not, it's not a logical, rational thing. It just kind of emerges from the experience of the back and forth, kind of like what you were saying, like all of a sudden 
yeah, I just don't want to do that behavior anymore because I've done it a bunch of times and I realize what the path of that is. And, and now it just drops away. And, but it's always been an accidental process. It hasn't, <laughs> it hasn't been an intentional process of that happening. It's just like, it just, all of a sudden it just, it ran out of juice or something. I don't, I don't know what it is. So I was kind of curious, like what the hell is actually happening with that? Well, yeah, so, um, you know, a lot of people try different Dharma techniques and different uh, therapy techniques, and sometimes, you know, they're kind of made fun of because, you know, we say, oh, they're shopping or something like that, but sometimes that works, you know, it's kind of like, I call it um, jiggling the refrigerator, you know, so if you have a heavy refrigerator and it's in one of those grooves in your kitchen and and the old ones had no wheels, you know, you had to do this. So, you know, we're trying different things. And, you know, what happens sometimes, uh, almost magically, it, it just shakes something loose, right? There's a little bit of a gap. So we create a, a gap in our uh, samsaric, our, our, our compulsivity, our addictive pattern. And what will happen uh, is, uh, you know, that's when uh, we would say, it's the opportunity for our, our Buddha nature to reveal itself, right? So even a little glimpse of our goodness, a little glimpse of uh, relief, a little glimpse of peace uh, can be tremendously inspiring. And we realize that that kind of uh, glimpse, this it, it's not produced through the normal cause and effect way. It's not just an antidote. It's something that's inherently there. So, uh, that kind of glimpse, even if it's short, can be tremendously uh, transforming like that. What do you think? <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense. So this is this is beyond conceptual elaboration. This is beyond it, this is the ultimate where we're we're creating, we're removing the defilements so that this can emerge actually. Yeah, we're getting out of the way of ourselves. <laughs> by accident or by design. Yeah. I think Dirk has his hand up again. Do you? Oh, okay. Was there somebody else before me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Evan, speak up. Where are you? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hello? Oh yeah. Um, hi. Um, yeah. Hi. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk, Lama. Um, I think most of you guys probably don't know me. Uh, <laughs> I've been kind of um, come every once in a while when we could still come in person. Um, I just want to share one little thing that I was thinking about. Um, there's a just a question that I've just found very useful that I ask myself sometimes, and it's um, it's just like, and I, um, I think it kind of relates to this. It's like whatever the thing is in your life or, you know, behavior, um, to ask myself, like, is this helping me or is this hurting me? And um, the trick to the question, though, I find is um, <laughs> you got to be very self-aware and you have to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you get those two does it, like, does it work? <laughs> but if you are, it can be a very useful question. And um, I've kind of... Um, kind of lessening the importance of some things in my life because of that question, you know? And then the other thing I wanted to mention is, um, you mentioned about peace. Um, in a lot of my readings about the Buddha is like, he's an amazing martial artist and he's, he's like amazing with bows and he's like a warrior priest. I was like, I feel like there's, there's some, there's some wisdom there, <laughs> you know, especially these, I just wanted to get your take on that, you know? Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, yeah. as far as Shakyamuni goes, according to what we know and what he talked about, of course, as a prince, he was part of the, um, you know, warrior um, class, uh, caste, kshatriyas. So he was trained, um, you know, in wrestling and archery and so forth like that. Uh, I, d I don't know if there's any evidence that he uh, continued that. You know, once he once he left the palace, mm -hmm. but um, you know, many of his like his 
his energy was very, you know, forthright kind of, uh, we could say kind of warrior bodhisattva style like that. But, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think he continued, you know, the, for, you know, that piece. Hmm. What do you think? I, I don't know. I, I just, I just find it interesting. And I wasn't aware of that aspect of his, you know, background, I guess. I, I, I just recently finished, um, the entire audio book of that, um, Old Path White Clouds is really oh. good, really super good. Just that story. Um, and yeah, just um, that 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 aspect was interesting to me, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he had that training. Yeah, uh, one of the turning points in his life was um, uh, the issue, you know, where he saved a swan. He was with his cousin um, Devadatta, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Devadatta uh, had his arrow and shot a swan, probably on the palace grounds. But Shakyamuni got to it first and was comforting it. And um, Devadatta demanded to have it back, but um, saying it belongs to me because I shot it. And Buddha said, uh, it belongs to the person that cares for it. And then they actually took it to court. And um, uh, Devadatta argued in front of the ministers and the king. And uh, even at a young age, the Buddha won that debate. So. Um, Generally, uh, you know, Dharma, we're after peace. And I've said a number of times, like, uh, you know, what, whatever people's cultural thing and eating is, um, you, you would never find anywhere um, where we would be interested thinking that killing animals has any kind of benefit. Uh, I understand. I understand some of the masid is like Shanti Deva, uh, perhaps there's, uh, you know, they wanted to get rid of him. Maybe it was another masid, but uh, they they thought he was eating the pigeons. <laughs> and they came in the room and they saw these. You're eating. Here's the here's the feathers. You're 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 eating pigeons. You're in the monastery. You can't you can't eat meat in the monastery. You can't eat the pigeons. He said, I'm not eating the pigeons. And then he snapped his fingers and the feathers came together and flew off. So, um, uh, you know, that, that those are magical Siddha qualities that um, uh, you may be able to develop, Evan, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, good. Thank we'll you. See. Yeah, we'll see. So Dirk still has something. Well, I was just uh, continuing to think about what James was talking about and what, what Susan uh, brought up about, uh, you know, my experience, even something, something, a behavior that I give up, let's say when I gave up smoking. Yeah. Although, although I get, although I give up this behavior, which I, you know, people say, oh, I quit smoking and cause I never really liked it. Well, that wasn't true of me. I loved smoking. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, when I when I gave I gave it up gradually. Uh, I just and I did wind up just getting sick of it, really. And nevertheless, it requires continue. It requires cultivation on my part to remain that way. I mean, just because I gave it up, just because I had this strong experience of giving it up, uh, and because just because I've been successful at giving it up, doesn't mean that I couldn't start smoking today very easily because it's got such a, it's such a habitual tendency on my part. And it was uh, uh, Kempo Dongya while he was talking, he, he, he used the term habitual tendency a lot, but it took me a few uh, times him saying it to understand that he wasn't saying happy Tibetans. <laughs> so I <could> say <laughs> the real cause here is the bad happy Tibetans. And I'm going, no, that's not what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> the visual tendency so the the cultivation bhavana meditation right, yes. is what, yes. I'm, what i'm saying yes yeah thank you yes um uh even when we discover dental floss and toothpaste and even when we go to the dentist and get our teeth cleaned we still have to brush our teeth so uh i've never met a teacher that uh wasn't still doing the training and practice. So, uh, 
when when we say sometimes that there's no more learning or someone's reached attainment, it means that um, they really enjoy doing their training and practice. They enjoy uh, maintenance. They enjoy, you know, just kind of chopping wood and carrying water, right? So, uh, you know, all the teachers have uh, always doing a lot of training and practice like that and going on retreat. And I'm very nosy and I, I'd actually ask them, which uh, by the way is um, traditionally very um, not polite. <laughs> you generally wouldn't ask the teacher, well, what's your personal, are you doing, are you doing your shot? <laughs> <laughs> like that. But they are doing it. If you don't do their practice uh, and training, then um, your your words and your actions will start separating, and you still may be able to give a very uh, eloquent Dharma talk, but uh, then it'll be, you know, you'll just keep, and eventually you'll fall in the water because it'll be like one foot in the railboat and one foot on the dock. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Who else? Uh, yeah. So, uh, this uh, is Masha. I don't know if I can just speak or if you needed to call on someone else if there was a line or cue. You're on. Sasha, so you're on. Yeah, so as somebody who's had a little bit of experience with martial arts, I just wanted to address that question. Um, I was actually drawn to Buddhism partially through martial arts because it's part of a lot of those practices or there's a lot of concepts that are very similar. And um, the, I have no idea. I have no experience or understanding of uh, the Buddha or any text related to this, but the, not, not but, my experience with it has been that martial arts isn't about violence, um, that it's about an understanding of the body and it requires um, discipline and application primarily. Um, and it's about understanding when to use action depending on the scenario you're in. And so those concepts seem to follow over into some of the things I'm learning about Buddhism. Um, and then the mental clarity of being able to um, move through a physical, a physical understanding, like an understanding of a physical choice. Like I get to choose whether I'm going to engage in this thing today or not. Um, mm -hmm. That teaching really comes in to that, that training um, in ways that I find similar to this idea of desire and engaging in desire that, that um, I have, I have a choice. I'm not uh, somehow overwhelmed only by my physical needs to be able to get some, you know, like I don't have to, to react to my physical needs. I can respond to them. I can make choices. So I don't know if that's helpful to, to continue the discussion forward. Yeah, thank you. And in, in reference to martial arts, of course, um, I like sharing that uh, I'm training in Tai Chi and, you know, Robert Nakashima is part of the Sangha and the temple. So, uh, uh, and we have yoga and so forth. So uh, it, it is hopefully a training in peace, you know, like Aikido, you know, peaceful way, Aikido, right? So. Hopefully we're doing Aikido, right? Not just the form of Aikido, but the whole thing. So training our body uh, is really important. Uh, so uh, in Vajrayana Tantra, uh, we're going to train in music and dance and art and crafts. So uh, and uh, of course, there's the famous Shalong monks like that um, who do these fantastic things. But uh, uh, but the Buddha, um, I, he mo mainly probably developed the, what we'd call the uh, inner martial arts after after he left as a prince like that. Uh, but uh, you bring up a good point about choice. 
Uh, so there, there always is a gap in the um, any kind of pattern, or we'd be out of luck, right? If there's no gap, we'd be screwed. So there is a gap, and if we're present to that, then we can make a choice to create another karmic chain. Absolutely. Yeah, good. Okay. Hi, Susan. Um, this is along a different line. Um, in the Theravada tradition, they have a term called stream enterer. Is yeah. that the same thing as um, this definite emergence? Is that the same thing? I don't know what stream uh, enterer is. Uh, they'd be I think it'd be slightly different. I don't know what that, you know, when someone takes goes for refuge in Theravada, you know, what, what the actual poly term is. So um, stream ender would be, you, you see some, uh, there's, there's some insight into the nature of things, right? So uh, it definitely has some kind of tr transitional state where you're moving away from some kind of uh, misknowledge into a knowledge state. But uh, the idea of wanting to leave samsara might be something different. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. That Thanks. is further study. <laughs> Another further study. Someone else. Thanks. Where's Charlotte? Charlotte's under the ohm. Yeah, the ohm. I'm here. OK, this is your time. Um. I had one of those experiences of a sudden change and I, I'm not quite sure what I did, except that I was um, really focusing on the concept of all living beings, all sentient beings wanting the same thing. And I suddenly lost, I had a severe spider phobia for most of my life and it suddenly went away and so i mean to the point where i couldn't stay in a room with a spider on the ceiling suddenly changed to they don't bother me at all and it was i i don't know what i did but it was a total change and sudden and it's it's hung on i mean it's not they don't bother me i don't want to get bitten i've experienced that thank you but i they don't terrify me anymore and i mean how does that work well uh that's one of the fruits of doing the training and practice. So you mentioned loving kindness, right? So you're doing a lot of compassion, loving kindness. So yes. uh, loving kindness, compassion meditations are uh, going to uh, loosen up the fear quite a bit. Thank you, Lama. Yeah. So it's, yeah, good point. And uh, one of the most famous suttas in Pali Canon called the Metta Sutta, which um, various Theravada teachers in America taken up, um, you know, where may all beings be happy, free from pain, and so forth. Uh, it's actually designed um, to, uh, you know, help the uh, yogis uh, deal with snakes. Snakes is always a big thing in India, particularly if you're walking around in the jungle. So uh, I think someone approached the Buddha and said, I don't want to go out because <laughs> there's snakes. So he, he said, you know, why don't you develop uh, loving kindness like that? So I have a lot of spider stories from India. <laughs> uh, and there are a lot of snake stories. So of course, uh, the Nagas or the snake beings are both um, you know, feared and kind of admired in India. And uh, Nagas, uh, particularly, uh, I guess, cobras uh, shielded the Buddha when it was raining one time. So you'll see statues where you have like all these snakes over the top of the Buddha, like that. <clears throat> so I think um, 
there are a lot of snake stories too for those people that um, are bothered by snakes. I'd like some cockroach stories too, and um, if people know them, or silver fish, you know, like in the bathtub stories. <laughs> okay, so uh, maybe we should close up here. If someone has a last minute comment, complaint, or a confession to make, that's okay. Yeah. When I look up, I'm, I'm kind of scanning the projection, so to see your faces or your icons or something like that. Hi, Roberto. Where are you? There you are. Hi. You're on. Go ahead, Roberto. Good to have you on. So if you need to turn on your mic. Oh, can you hear me? There you go. All right. Yeah, I have, I have both. I have a comment and a confession. Um, okay. The confession is um, that I don't like the idea of reincarnation. I, I don't like to think about that. I, I, it, it goes to me in a place where it's just about, about like dogma, like something that you believe on Monday and you stop to believe on Tuesday. For me, for me. Sure. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and the comment is is about the uh, that violence. It seems to me to be attached to fear, uh -huh. almost like cause and consequence. So when when I see myself be being aggressive or violent behind, there is always some kind of fear, and I see that in other people too. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, fear is, uh, fear is a composite uh, emotion, which is why make, which makes it difficult because fear is based on grasping, wanting to pull something closer, based on aversion, wanting to push something away or anger, and then it's based on um, not knowing or bewilderment. So, in trauma, you know, deep trauma, there's this intense terror because we don't know. Uh, should we hold on, let go? Should we run? Should we stay? So uh, that's, you know, that kind of terror, that kind of huge crisis, that trauma is uh, uh, the essence of samsara. So usually when we say samsara and we translate it as just dissatisfaction or suffering, it, it's too um, tame. It's really uh, supposed to be experienced as horrific and you want to get out. So when we really experience how horrific some of the horrible things that happen are, and we want to uh, become peaceful ourselves and be around peaceful people, um, you know, I don't think you always have to think about uh, whether you believe in continuity of lives or not, right? Um, so uh, as usual, I'm kind of in the middle. I, 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 I don't think, uh, you know, particularly in the West, we have to, to start doing uh, serious practice. We have to uh, ascend to a continuity of lives, you know, because we're not, we don't have the direct experience of that. But we do have the direct experience that things suck and the direct experience that things can be better. Uh, when, when we're getting into working with um, the uh, deeper levels of meditation, doing Mahamudra, Tantra, uh, and, and Dzogchen, um, we're, we really have to uh, come to some kind of certainty. Does uh, is the mind continuous, or does it come to an end? Or how to and how does one mind moment um, follow the next mind moment? So uh, at that point, we have to personally verify uh, experientially for our, ourselves whether that's true or not. But uh, I agree, you know, like when we're first starting off. Uh, uh, you know, take the teachings that you can put into practice. Uh, you might think, okay, this is a qualified teacher, so I'm willing to kind of uh, work with things I don't absolutely know yet. But there's no reason, and it's not good to assent to something just to kind of join in where we, you know, we don't uh, believe in it like that. 
So Dharma Zoe is based on uh, investigation and personal validation. So thank you for bringing that up. Appreciate that. So uh, yeah, good. So we should say goodbye probably. Um, uh, thank you everybody for coming. Stay healthy, please. Like like that. So. <clears throat> Lama, how are you feeling after having had that shot? Oh, yeah, thanks. So um, actually yesterday and now today, I'm, I'm feeling back to my normal kind of annoying self. And um, uh, but I will get another vaccination, second one on February 13th. I was a little bit like cold or something before I got the vaccination last Saturday. And then it came on about 36 hours later, and uh, it was it, it just felt like the flu. Unfortunately, I knew what it was. If I didn't, I would think, oh my God, I, I do have COVID, right? So um, yeah, thanks for asking. I've just been tired, you know, like that. So, but now I'm I'm feeling perky. Thanks for asking. But I, there could be another negative uh, response, you know, after the second one, this, the, the Moderna like that, but, um, and then it's interesting talking to people that have various ideas about vaccine and non-vaccine and uh, stuff like that, you know, so we have those discussions. So um, I'm generally a vaxxer and uh, being married to Sabrina, I, I absolutely have no choice. <laughs> I do have a choice, but none of the choices are good. So I, I'm, I'm going to get vaccinated, but I I, th I think it worked for me because my body responded with that. So, yeah, thanks for asking. I had to cancel some darshans and things like that, so I apologize. You know, but my goal is um, to try to walk the talk and take care of myself. Thanks for asking. Okay, dedication prayers. Yeah. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful, Chen Rezig, Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. And may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. And I'm gonna say that one again, Lo Song, Magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manzushri, master of flawless wisdom. Rajapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Sankhava, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Lissangdrapa, I make requests at your holy feet. Lama, you're muted. Oh, yeah, on my back. So I wanted to give a shout out to Jack in Washington. Uh, she's moving up to Kingston. Can you say a few things? Sure. So I, I, hi, Lama. Thank you. And hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, some of you know that I've been up in Washington for the last several months since May. And you can ask me what's happened with the land project that I was on. Um, you know, text me or email me, we can talk about it. But I'm going to be moving and I'm moving to Kingston. Um, it's this really cool little town. And um, Lamala has given me permission to start a meditation group there. So I look forward to continuing that practice um, of the temple through that uh, class. Yeah, good. 
Thank it you, will Mom. be successful. Thank you. Yeah. And is Donna Adler still on? Okay. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Donna and Arizona, uh, uh, retired nurse. She's going to um, give a talk on the second Bumi, the Dasit Bumika, uh, in April. So, um, and she's in Arizona, and hopefully we'll create a sitting group there too, uh, like that. So, do we have any other announcements um, before we say goodbye? The Temple Tech Fund, yes. So, um, we've had some very generous donations to uh, the uh, fund to uh, continue to improve uh, our ability to transmit Dharma uh, through video and electronically, and also within the temple. Uh, I'd like to, you know, thank those people just over the last couple of weeks, and uh, those people that have given in the past. Um, it's it's expensive to uh, talk in person and also transmit and have everything fitting together. It's actually been something that started a long time ago when um, you know people helped put together the uh, you know the loudspeakers and the, the uh, audio system and Dana and Doug uh, put in a lot of work to that so we will be using that uh, when uh, we've improved the lighting uh, so uh, uh, you know Dan has put a lot of work into the lighting and uh, uh, Gump and also in the parking lot. So these things, these are teching up so we can be safe and transmit. So we're probably a little over halfway to the goal and we're going to be start, you know, putting together things already. We've um, had it wired so that eventually we can have uh, a monitor and sound back in the uh, dojo community room and we can have a TV and so forth. So um, the estimated cost maybe altogether is like 20000 which is actually a lot of money, but also to uh, compare uh, other churches and Dharma centers, uh, probably spent close to 100000 on their um, technology. So uh, we have to do it because I, I can't, I won't want to lose anybody that's uh, dialing in remotely. So, uh, you know, thank you again to everybody. And um, uh, I'm going to go buy a lottery ticket tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the only problem is lottery tickets are not subject to divinations. Why is that? Oh, so this little aside. So um, uh, it is possible to do uh, divinations to find things out. Um, uh, I don't. I, I do divinations occasionally. Um, that kind of comes with the Lama certificate, but um, the problem with divinations, if people are asking things, is uh, sometimes you get bad news, and most people don't want bad news, right? So then you should go to, you know, somebody at the fair or a psychic or something who will give you good news. Um, but it's it's based on um, uh, karma. So if there's no, you know, uh, intention or will. You, you can't know exactly what's going to happen, you see. Um, so you can't predict, like, uh, you know, how the, how the roulette table is going to work out or who's going to win the lottery. Um, as far as I know, I don't know any psychic that's actually, um, uh, you know, won at the lottery like that. So divinations are just connecting um, with someone's long karmic chain. And even when there is a divination, uh, and that's a big part of uh, certain aspects in Vajrayana, there's still just possibilities, right? So um, they also take, um, so if you get a traditional divination, the teacher will say, well, this this has a good likelihood of happening. Um, because a lot of times they're around a business or marriage or relationships or avoiding certain things. But you have to do this uh, practice uh, in addition to it. So they will give you um, 
uh, practices to do. So if you don't do them, it's on you and it won't work. So uh, I rarely ask, have asked teachers for divinations because then they will uh, give you a practice commitment. And then, uh, so it's not like the West where you, you find out like, oh, it's gonna happen no matter what. And I don't have to do anything. I'll just wait for the money to show up. <laughs> So everything in Dharma has to, you know, we have to put in our personal experience. Sorry, just need a little aside there. <laughs> like that. So is that any other announcements I mean, before we close? Um, Johnny's painting on the mural today. At oh, 2:30. when? At 2.30 today. Okay. So uh, our Kalachakra mandala that's on the um, outside the building on the alley is uh, being embellished by our artist, Johnny. So uh, if you don't know about that, you can go to uh, Autumn's website or our website to look at the short video. Is that right, Autumn? Can, where, where can you find... The video about Johnny. I don't know if Autumn's still on. But. Yeah, it's on my social media at this point. Yeah. It's uh, on my Instagram and it's on my Facebook, and I think it's been shared on the Facebook, your Facebook page as well. But yeah, we should maybe put it out somewhere on the website. I can upload it to to like Vimeo or something. We want to put okay, it on well, your one. You, you techies get together and talk, okay? <laughs> hey, Dirk. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, YouTube is easiest for public stuff, but Vimeo will work too. Thanks. Okay. All right. Sounds good. We will do it. Well, so thank you, everyone, for your um, time, your precious time today. It's, uh, it's fun. Dharma is fun. So... Uh, it never feels like a burden to me, you know. I don't, I don't burn out um, because each moment seems like uh, really weird and new. And uh, you're all such interesting creatures. <laughs> so thank you so much. So we'll say goodbye. We've done everything, I think. Have we? All right. Yeah. So uh, stay healthy. Have fun. Save the world. Okay. Ciao. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> ha,